Hey guys, welcome back to the online event series, Catholic Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. My name is Elise, I'm the organizer and fellow panelist, and this is the Q&A video section with my best friends, Catherine and Adora. All right, guys, let's kick this off. So the first question is from Michelle, and it's for Catherine. Um, the question is, how did you first learn that people saw you quote unquote differently? I really appreciate this question, Michelle, um, just the way that it's worded, because I think um, usually white people, myself included, do not process this in detail. And I figured this out the hard way, um, but I think we feel it. It's some, there's a lot that's unsaid that is more felt. And so my first experience of feeling different that I'll then process with you um was just meeting this um this very um intentional black man in a laundromat who knew um who knew i was open for conversation so we chatted about a lot of topics and then he decided to bring out his big guns you could tell this was like his favorite topic and he started it out with you are racist automatically because you are white and I just felt that as all of a sudden, okay, we are, you just pushed me halfway across the room, but you still want to have a conversation with me, but you don't want it to go anywhere. And I felt that difference. And at first, you know, you feel that sense of being attacked, but then it leads you to a, a question of what makes you feel that way and starting to feel very distant and wondering why I was seen differently. And I think, I think the answer to this question is really, I felt different when I realized that my experiences put me in a place where I felt more connected to others than they felt to me. So I, that, that in an essence is how I experienced feeling different, but it was almost worse being an empath it's worse knowing that other people feel that I am different in a way that's hurtful to them. So for instance, this man, I, I would almost prefer the, the interaction to have been, you know, we're both different and we appreciate that there's good aspects to difference, but knowing that there were negative aspects to difference that I fit into whether I put myself there or not, that was a significant turning point in my understanding of being Caucasian. That was only a couple of years ago. So I even had had re like relationships with people from all kinds of different races and had never, because of the relationship, I had never realized that that difference was perceived. But um, in relationships, those perceptions are everything. And so I think there was some emotional pain there with realizing that I, my main desire with my personality is to be connected with everyone. But when I realized that wasn't possible, um, it was a feeling of difference. So. Hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing. And, um, you know, I, I think it's beautiful that that as with your background, you know, being Caucasian, that um, you can also like empathize and like have a moment where like you have a story of when you were awakened or aware of, or whatever that you want to use the word for, that um, you have a race attributed to you too. Um, and, and that has its own dynamics. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Adora, so, Susan has a question for, for you. Um, Susan's question is, how can we help race relations on a grassroots level in our communities so real relationships between different people can grow? Hey, uh, great question. So I think when I hear grassroots, I think authentic. I think like non-professional, not that it's done poorly, but that it's just done like authentically and in a raw way. And so I think that starts with relationships, which she kind of already mentioned in her question. Um, so if you're gonna start something at a grassroots level, like you have to have authentic relationships with people to make that happen, right? Um, 
So I think like an example that just comes to mind immediately is, you know, I'm part of this Catholic group for people of color called the Toltenites, right? That you are also in. And basically that started in a grassroots way. I met two African-American guys at church. We exchanged numbers. We were interested in continuing to talk. There were a couple more people who we met at mass who were also interested in that conversation. We got together for dinner at my apartment. So that's, you know, just opened my door to these people. And we all sat down and we had dinner. We had authentic conversation. That authentic conversation turned into people wanting to continue because they saw they had some bonds with each other that they couldn't really express in other spaces. And then from there, they just like rooted together under this common cause of wanting to help people who are people of color who either are Catholic or who are looking at Catholicism. They wanted to create that space. So since they had that common goal and they were starting to form a relationship, it kind of just like took off from there. Um, so I think it just, it starts with authentic relationship and the vulnerability to open doors. So like, if this person who asked the question is wanting to make those grassroots efforts, maybe she can find a way to invite people into her space, to invite people into conversation um, and really create a framework and a space for that to happen. That's awesome. First, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for your responses for Susan and, um, Michelle, and this is not related to what we're talking about, but seeing you guys in the same frame, I miss you guys. You guys are so cute and like oh, thank you. So beautiful. <laughs> we love you, girl. <laughs> we wish we were with you. Me too. When we are in conversation, it's just like pure joy. And so I feel like that's what enables any conversation to happen. Like we can talk about basically anything and enjoy it because you two both matter so much to me. And I think like to Adora's question, um, with the whole grassroots thing, I don't think you force relationships to use them for the conversation. I think the conversation comes when you have people who you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so good. 100% ditto both of what you guys said. Um, yeah, I just really enjoyed watching cause like, you know, it's different being in person and like seeing you guys, like when Adora's talking, Catherine's like smiling in the background. And like when Catherine's talking, Adora's smiling in the background. It's so cute. <laughs> I just love it so much. And I, I, yeah, you guys are so precious to me. So, oh, thank you, <laughs> um, yeah, I think we have one more question and, um, I guess I'll introduce it. So it's from Gary and he asked an interesting question that I thought I would try to take up. It is, um, do you think this current climate of racial division is all part of end times? So I find this really interesting um, because you know the three of us, we are believers and end times is like one of those riveting talking points that involves some extremes and it's also part of so many different places like mostly from various religious worldviews. So there's like the Mayan calendar and their priests who created the calendar system and for them and the Christian theology of Armageddon and Islamic theology of day of judgment, Judaic theology of the messianic age, Hindu theology of the final reincarnation, even science theories about the ultimate fate of the universe. So, you know, for, for Bob's question, I want to, I want to, um, take a little liberty and reframe the context to end up returning with a question. So the, the, the thought that I'm having is if we indeed that we are in end times, whether to face the judgment of a higher power for our moral doings or for our final opportunity to reach a higher level of awareness, like, um, like in the incarnation talk conversation of Hinduism, um, Racist inclinations and racist behaviors are not indicative of virtuous morals. So then regardless of your worldview, um, it would logically follow that the vast majority of the world who do believe in end times ideology, that we should feel naturally compelled to address the prejudices that are within ourselves and to help our friends and neighbors behave more peacefully and safely to no longer enact things like racial discrimination. And um, then I, I realize, as I say this, that there are a few who would posit to say that simply because it's end times, it is also the time to behave with as much evil as you possibly can. But 
I would argue that for those in the healthy functioning mind, and especially those who are socialized persons in civic society, um, who don't need to be rehabilitated to be part of society, they're unlikely to publicly endorse behaving with as much malice and discrimination towards their neighbors simply because it may be end times. So um, although I, you know, I believe in Jesus and I believe in God, like a triune God as my Lord and Savior and um, and, 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 and anyhow, I, I heard this beautiful story about 10 years ago, and I might be butchering it. It was about end times in conversation with an ordinary Jewish person. So again, I'm not Jewish, but I think it's a beautiful story. This Jewish person in the story um, was someone who had a tree farm, and he was asked what he would do if he had only one day left on earth, and it was the end of the world, not just his last day of, on earth. And the Jewish person said, I would do the same thing I do every day, faithfully plant and take care of my trees. And so, you know, we could take that story in a couple ways. We could say that, oh, that means we should give up on improving anything beyond the tree farm. Or we could look at his faithfulness to the tree farm and those who depend on it to stay the course and doing his very best to create cleaner air with the trees, giving the trees proper support and hoping that his best is good enough for what that day needed. So I, I interpret it the second way, and I hope others do too. Of course, I use this story as a metaphor. I hope others can look at the racial tension and the racial divides in our country and look at it with the intention to do their very best, to be faithful, to hope that it is good enough for that particular day. And then if we're blessed enough to wake up the next day and the world isn't over, then get up and do our very best, be faithful, be a good neighbor, be a good friend, a true friend, who wants to love and not discriminate and, and put our friends down and hope it was good enough for that day when we rest our head to sleep. And if we get to wake up the next day, then thank God for blessing us with another day and, and be faithful again. So, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier that I would respond by kind of reframing the context for Bob's question. And the question that I would have in return is, how would you interpret that story as well? Um, is it one that means that if we are in end times that we should act with as much malice as possible and, and allow for um, our imperfect discriminations to continue or does it mean that we try our best as we go out with a bang, you know, whatever end times means for you. Um, yeah, so that's the end of my, my little thing for, for Bob's question. Um, and thank you guys so much for sharing with with these questions and these thoughts um i i want to give an opportunity you know since we've answered a few questions from that were pre-submitted um adora and catherine do you have any other thoughts too about these questions that were submitted i feel like i can see some gears worrying so <laughs> i want to invite you to share whatever you would like as well to the question on the end time your um you're such a storyteller, Elif. I love that about you. And um, I love that story about the trees. But um, just thinking, thinking about this question, it leads me to ask myself the question, why, why do we have to jump to things like end times or major like major shifts or next steps when we talk about racism. I think we immediately, when we deal with something difficult, we want to universalize it into a macro level. It's a cosmos thing. It's a global thing. It's a national thing. Racism is a person to person thing that can then become systemic. But kind of like, I guess, a virus pandemic analysis is similar, where it's like it can become a global issue, but I, the healing is always a localized. And so I feel like it's beautiful how you brought the question from this cosmos perspective to a, an individual perspective. It's the individual Jewish man and his trees. It's really me and the people I meet at the laundromat and the people I'm friends with. And that is where I think if we really, really, truly want to make human beings better, I think the big level, and I'm a macro thinker too, I think the big level has to take the back seat in that conversation. What do you think? 
because maybe like we think the same thing, but in, with different language. Um, because I think that the macro level will like be impacted by what's being done individual to individual. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so not, so it's hard because I do think it's important to think about what is happening at the macro because I know a lot of people's pain like has to do with like the more systemic stuff too. Although I do agree that interpersonal healing mm -hmm. is needed at the same time, you know? So I think yeah. it's like both and. Yeah. I guess, I guess it's also interesting to me. It's interesting to me that at the end of the day, we're responsible for our individual behaviors, but then as a society, we're also responsible for the direction that's taking. So I, I think um, it's very helpful to make those distinctions of personal and systemic, but when we're talking about racism, which kind are we addressing? Um, so I, I, I love that you brought that in because I think a lot of people in my life have mentioned that. Too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, you know, I'm I'm like so excited now for when we're gonna have our our recording of the conversation. Our personal <laughs> as we explore these things. And yeah, I, I think it's so beautiful, you know, like as you were speaking, Catherine, I was also reminded of like the way that I was trained as a healthcare worker, you know, and then us being in ministry in different ways, the three of us, right? Like yeah. We can, we, we always need the mission of like the big, right, in mind. But when we're, if I'm doing like patient bedside manner, if I'm counseling someone in therapy, it's always that one person, there's that identified patient. And in ministry too, it's like whoever you have the appointment with or like um, an adora, like for you too, as you're like in ministry and in your different spaces, like it's whose story are you with at that moment, right? Like, it, yeah, that like interweaving of like both spaces and yet somehow inside each of us is an experience that touches on and engages with that bigger space. And so like inside each of us, there's a world, there's like a universe of, or a system of experiences and a system of, of perceptions. And like we, we shift out those lenses, almost like we're a camera with different, different lenses and and then we engage and then like in our personal conversations like right now as friends we can bring all those things to the table and we're like and we have that intimacy to be able to engage like a group because it's like i know you individually i know you individually you know each other individually you know me individually and so like we have that like individual focus and the groupiness like or the system or whatever of our group, like all present together at the same time. And that's the luxury that personal relationship has is we could do both at the same time, but without personal relationship. And by the way, I don't have all, I don't have answers. I'm just kind of like, da -da -da -da, like as yeah. we're counting, it's like maybe like in other spaces without that personal relationship, you can only do one thing at a time. Hmm. Oh. Um, yeah, but that's just what came to mind when you guys talk. Like the dynamism is impacted by the level of relationship. That's a good point too, Elise, because so many people who I have conversations about these topics with, I'm in relationship with all of them, but the extent to which we can productively have conversations about these topics is directly also related to how an individual has processed their world and what they've seen, how they've engaged with it. Like you said, those lenses, yeah. because if there's been no engagement or reflection or anything, then I, I don't think it's, I, I still value that relationship, but that, that topic is not something we can fruitfully address. Self-reflection and those lenses impact our, those lenses impact our conversation. So, um, yeah, I really like that image because it, it, I'm almost seeing three levels here. There's mm -hmm. the level at which I reflect and I'm able to reflect on my relationships and the world at large. Then I can engage with an individual, again, on both those levels, on the individual level and about the world at large. But that's what I have control over is that expanding circle of influence. And so that is what I see it myself as responsible for in a just society kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
Adora, I see your gears turning. <laughs> I'm just like soaking in everything you guys are saying, you know? I'm like, yeah, the interpersonal thing is just truth. So I'll let you know if I have anything more exciting to say, but that's, I'm just taking in what you're saying. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I want to echo again and circle back to what you guys said that building those relationships is where things start to happen. Inner change, outer change, relational building, community building, whether it's grassroots or um, helping someone know that they have a racial experience and a racial identity as well as that their voice is valid to come into the conversation. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, you guys. I love these chats. And um, I feel like we can, I know that we can talk forever. So I'm going to just cut this short as um, the bad cop being um, the, the timekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, you guys. It was so fun. And I hope this is encouraging for those who are watching that maybe it inspires those who are watching to start some conversations with the important people in your life, whether you have questions or you want to share something you experienced or just to make this topic a little less scary, a little more approachable. And with that, we just wish you all God bless. Peace.